All right, so this week, this week we're leaving the arithmetic mentality and moving many, many years later into the geometric mentality. And maybe some of you think of Pythagoras when you think of geometry. Who else do you think of when you think of geometry? Who do you think of? Euler absolutely contributed, but Euler lived in the 1700s. So we're talking, that's a long time afterwards. Euclid? Who did you say? Da Vinci? Da Vinci, 1400s, right? Okay, what, Euclid? Pythagoras, does anybody know when Pythagoras lived? He lived BC. He lived in the 6th century BC. In fact, he was born in 570 BC, okay? That's 200 years before Euclid. That's 300 years before Plato and Aristotle. He actually had great influence on Plato and Aristotle. So when you think of Pythagoras, what do you think of first? Typically when you think of Pythagoras, you think of a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? And what do we use that for? Right triangles. And we all know that, right? You probably learned that back in the seventh grade or even earlier for the first time, right? And it's a theorem that we all take for granted now, but it's, it, is such, it is of such great importance because there are 90 degree angles uh, in many places and it's become a very useful theorem, of course. But he goes so beyond that. And actually, a squared plus b squared plus c squared um, predated Pythagoras. He did not recognize, he was not the first person to recognize that. In fact, the ancient Babylonians, there's texts that prove that they used that formula, okay? Um, the Egyptians, and I'll tell you a bit, little bit more about that, when they were building the pyramids, were able to create those um, very strong bases by using that formula, right, for the, for the angles. So he, but he was able to prove it. Okay, and the whole idea of proof, and the whole idea of truth, that's what he was about. And it actually goes beyond him. He became a way, it became a way of life, to the point where there was a whole cult following, you might even call it a religion, for hundreds of years after he died, called the Pythagoreans. And I'll tell you all about them and what they did and how they influenced the many philosophers after them and the religious cults. They were thought of as a religious cult. They were into numerology. They'd all, they did all kinds of funky stuff, okay? And so why? Because he, Pythagoras, saw the world through math, through music, and through philosophy, nature. And he connected all three of those things and that's what laid out the tradition of Pythagorasm. The interesting thing, though, is that he never wrote anything down. There's nothing written from Pythagoras. So anything that is passed on from him, bless you, um, some things were definitely done by his pupils, right, um, his students, and then things were written down afterwards, but also many things were lost. So when things aren't written down, it really becomes legend. So we don't know exactly what is truth, what is story, what is myth. So we take these stories and it helps us piece together the puzzle, but it doesn't fully give us truths. But it's an interesting story either way, right? You all know that the Bible wasn't written down for 400 years either after the apostles died. So you could think about that. Okay. There's actually also um, beliefs that Pythagoras wasn't one person, maybe he was a woman. There was all kinds of contradicting beliefs with that. Here it is, right? The geometric, so he, he did this proof geometrically. All right, he showed that the square, if you take the length of the hypotenuse and you square it, the area of that square is equal to the two other sides squared. We all take it for granted. Maybe. But it was quite the proof. And there's other proofs for this theorem as well. 
Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about his, his life. He actually came from a wealthy family. He grew up on the island of Samos, which is one of the southern Greek islands, and his father was a wealthy merchant. But back in the 6th century BC, it was an agricultural um, land and culture and community, right? So they were all farmers. He happened to be, because he was from a wealthy family, he received a lot of um, private teachers and tutoring, right? There were no formal schools yet. People didn't go to school. Um, but he was able to work with philosophers and, and people because they also believed that he was highly intelligent from an early age. In fact, before he was even born, the story goes that his father went to Italy. His father was told um, by the Greek god Apollo that his son would be of otherworldly. His son would be godly. So his father had the money and he built a Greek temple to Apollo. And, and he prayed there. And then when Pythagoras was born, they already knew that he was something special. Is this legend? I don't know. You, Jack's not so sure. So that's how the story goes. So Pythagoras from a very early age showed that he was um, bright. He wanted to learn as much as he could. He was very much into philosophy. He studied geometry. Um, but this, the sad thing is his father died when he was 18 years old. But his father's friends actually also supported him and ensured that he received the kind of teachings that his father would wish for. What happened after his father died, though, Polycrates, a tyrant, took over Samos. And Samos was not, it wasn't the same. <laughs> it became, so he, he uh -huh. so he recognized at an early age that he needed to fl flee. He needed to leave. So he did. He left. He, now he's in his 20s. He left and he traveled around Asia Minor and he went to Babylon. And when he was in Babylon, he studied astrology. And he was, they think, one of the first to recognize the, an eclipse and what, um, he started studying the planets, well, or identifying that there were other planets. He was one of the first people, they believe, to recognize that the Earth actually goes around the sun. Okay? So what does all that mean? He was able to take that and, and also identify the four seasons. He got very much into describing the four elements, right? What are the four elements? Water, earth, fire, air. Good. So he was, he was very into nature. He studied, again, he studied in Babylon. He continued to travel. And then he went to Lebanon. And guess what happened in Lebanon? They didn't like that he, was, that he questioned and he explored and, and he was curious and investigative. It, they didn't like that. So they decided to sell him off as a slave to Egypt. And what was going on in Egypt at the time? The pharaohs, right, were the kings of Egypt at the time. So from Lebanon, they put Pythagoras on a boat and they sent him off to Egypt. And he knew that he was being sold for slavery. So what did he do on the boat? He decided to not eat and to meditate the whole way. And we're not talking about just hours, we're talking about days. And so he was able to go without food or water or speaking with people for days on end. And they recognized through this that he may be godly, that he was certainly special. And they let him go free. So he got to Egypt. So now he's in Egypt. And he's traveling down the Nile. And he winds up in Memphis. And now he's with the pharaohs. And he loves Egypt. He's studying with, he's finding philosophers, he's finding more learned, learned people, and he's studying math, and he's, he's fascinated by the pyramids. And so he's, he's working in what he loves to do. But then guess what happened? Egypt was taken over by who? The Phoenicians. The Phoenicians invaded Egypt, it was the end of the pharaohs. Egypt become, became a dark place. He knew he had to get out of there. Okay? 
But hold on, I did want to show you a little video. Pythagoras was the son of a wealthy Samnian jeweler and had passed a trouble-free childhood learning as much about every facet of mathematics, science, and philosophy as he possibly could. We are told he was handsome and personable, and his intelligence and thirst for learning were impossible to quench. Each and every person who met Pythagoras recognized his potential. He was happy, inquisitive, and popular. Most boys would probably be educated by their parents, by their fathers. They wouldn't have very much that they needed to know. They would tend to know what was necessary for farming and for basic activities like that. It's unlikely that most people would ever learn to read. But for the rich, things were slightly different. Uh, they would be people who had a future as political leaders. They would expect to be able to speak in public and to engage in social activities with other rich people. The kind of things that they would learn to do would be to read and write, to speak in public, to play musical instruments, and probably to sing and even to compose songs on the spot. OK, so that's just a little B-rated, low-budget documentary, but interesting. Um, so then he had to leave Egypt. He recognized that he needed to go. So he went on, he, went, he wanted to go back to his homeland. At this point, he was an older adult, and, or mid, probably midlife, and at this point he decided that, and like any good leader would do, because he started developing his own pupils, that he would want to start his own school, so to speak. It wasn't called school at that time, okay? You also have to realize that Pythagoras was the first person, he's also often called the first philosopher, because he actually took the words philos and sophia, which means lover of wisdom, and put it together to name this branch of study and this field philosophy. That comes from him. So he goes back to Samos, and when Samos is not the same as it was because of uh, the tyranny, Samos had, had been completely destroyed. There was a lot of destruction. Um, and he wasn't finding the excitement and the curiosity for learning that had been there previously. So then he realized he, mu he, once, he must once again leave Samos. He goes to Croton. So he travels to Cro Croton. And while he's there, he decides to develop his own schools. And people are recognizing that he, who he is and that he's got um, a lot to teach. And so he develops followers. And these followers and Pythagoras, it's not just about mathematics. They were potentially the first vegetarians. They did not even eat beans. He was really against beans. And you should look that up, why he didn't like beans. And they were not allowed to eat beans. They did not eat meat. They had a very clean way of living, OK? He believed in the reduction down to um, simplicity, being aware of the elements, OK, and making choices that way. He also, they also believed in reincarnation. All right, they believed that the soul and the body was immortal, and then after the death, they would move on and, and take on another life form. Okay? These are pretty radical at the time where he was. Croton was a Greek colony, and it was currently unaffected by war. Pythagoras then began the mammoth task of striving to enlighten and teach the people of Croton his way of life, and in doing so, helping them to find a better existence. As one of his followers was to note, but courage, men are children of the gods. And slowly, he began to attract more and more people, men and women alike, who shared his outlook and desire for a permanent change from war and struggle to stability and community. So along with vegetarianism, they were very much against uh, the idea of gluttony. OK? So if you were at a celebration with the Pythagoreans, it wouldn't mean there would be a bounty of food and drink. In fact, there is such a thing as a Pythagorean cup. I have to show you. I could not get over this. So the Pythagorean cup 
was made so that if the chalice was filled with wine, if you drank what was considered a modest amount, then you would not spill the wine. If you drank wine, all, you know, if you continued and you drank down past where that straw looking piece goes up, what would happen to the wine? It would come through the straw and actually spill all over you. And so this was um, made so that you could develop self-control. Interesting. OK, I just want to back up for a second. Um, this is really interesting about Pythagorean theorem itself. There was such a thing in Egypt when they were building the temples, we had the Egyptian rope stretchers. And these were surveyors that would go out into the fields. And they, would, they calculated on a rope. They would tie knots of equal distance, right? And they recognized that if you had a knot, three knots on one side or three equal segments on one side, and you had four equal segments on the other side, right, and you created a 90 degree angle with them, then you would, well, to be able to create that 90 degree angle, you would have to take a segment of five equal segments on the third side, which is now, we know, the hypotenuse. And that's how you knew you had a 90 degree angle, OK? So, and it was actually probably, this was probably tied into um, religious events as well and celebrations when they were building new temples and pyramids. So here the Pythagoreans now are practicing their way of life. It's spreading. His followers are becoming um, more and more, right? And um, one of the things that he, they believe that the uh, number 10 was the perfect number. So they were into numerology. And they thought that there was, uh, again, this, this spiritual essence. They didn't just look at the world with math. They didn't think that math was just related to the physical world. They also thought there was a connection to the spiritual world. All right, so very similar to a lot of yogic tradition, Vedic, Brahmins, and the Hindus, there was a big tie-in between mathematics and religion. Okay, very similar in that respect. I don't doubt when he was in Asia Minor that he also met other people from those traditions. Um, so, so they started designing their symbols, right? And they had their secret symbols that were part of the brotherhood in Pythagoreanism. And the number 10 was considered the greatest number. Okay, so we're going to, and they had all these geometric symbols to represent the numbers. I'm going to show you the first few numbers. But the number 10 was so important that when Plato and Aristotle, who you might, cons be con you might consider um, as Pythagoras' students, uh, Aristotle wrote about the theory of opposites. And he has a table of lists of opposites, right? What do we think of, what do you think of with opposites in mathematics? Give me an example of an opposite. Negative one and one, right? And that, that's their distance from zero. That's why they're opposite on the number line. They brought that beyond mathematics, and, they, and Pythagoras recognized if there is dark, there is light, right? If there is good, there is evil. So he recognized this, and this was all discussion 600 years before Catholicism and Christianity. Um, and Aristotle actually wrote that down, and it said that he wrote down a table of 10 because 10 was that special number, okay? So they got into numerology. We would consider this cultish at this point. One more little video. But clearly, two of the main sources are those who have left us the most uh, books from around that period, which are Plato and Aristotle. It was, in fact, Plato who took the findings of Pythagoras and developed the idea of the spherical Earth's tilting on an axis, which explained the changes to days and seasons. But he did so on the back of the word of Pythagoras. The planets were a source of continual wonderment to Pythagoras. 
One theory developed by him was that each of the five known planets that were known to orbit the sun gave off a note as it journeyed on its course. The pitch of the note depended on the distance of each individual planet from the sun and the speed with which it traveled in its path. It was caused by its passage through the upper air or the ether. He called it the harmony of the spheres and he must have mused long on the beauty of that heavenly music which the earthbound were destined never to hear. So another story as it goes is that he was passing a blacksmith when he was in Croton and he noticed that the blacksmith was hitting a piece of metal with an anvil and depending on where he was on the metal the sound changed. And so that led him to investigate um, the whole idea of pitch right, and scale. And so from that, he went, on, he went on to study the whole idea of, of scale. And then what, what they were just explaining was that when he looked at the planets, or considered the planets, and the idea of planets being at different distances from the sun, just like on a scale, what he thought was if it was a certain distance, it would give off a certain pitch. And this is what became known as the music of the spheres, right? Okay, so this was not all accepted very uh, greatly by, by everybody. You have to understand that. Before I get into that, though, I want to show you the idea of numerology and this sacred geometry. Okay, this is how they represented their numbers. So the number 10 was represented as a tetractus. I can never pronounce that correctly. Um, and you'll see here that it's a figure with 10 points made into a triangle, okay? This was considered um, the holiest or the most important, the most divine. Where does this come from? Well, you could talk about the monad. And if any of you have familiarity with the Hindu traditions or the yogic traditions, you'll know that there's the bindu, right? That represent Bindi, that represents infinity. Well, the number one was the monad represented number one. So think about in mathematics, the point, right? We talked last week about the point being without dimension. The point um, comes before the line, which comes before the plane, which comes before three dimensional space. So one represents the beginning. So the point in the circle, and the circle represents infinity. So we have the monad. From one comes two. So we have two-ness or otherness. This represents the feminine. Okay, it's the joining of the two circles. It's an equal balance between the two. And then once you take two and one and you put them together, of course, you have three, but then three comes to represent the triad, the triangle. And three is when numbers come into being, right? Triads, triangles, and, and number three is an auspicious number in many cultures because all of a sudden there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's the number three or the triad. And it goes and then explains the principle that everything is whole and perfect. We have the four, which is the tetrad. This is auspicious because now we have four points in space. It connects to the pyramids and the idea of these three-dimensional structures. And then we have the pentad and the hexad. Right? And it continues on and on. So they use these, again, for spiritual reasons, for, um, for study, and to keep certain secrets. Okay? When you talk about wholeness and beauty, 
For people at that time, whole numbers is also represented wholeness and beauty. Okay? The whole idea of an irrational number was unacceptable. If you could imagine, at this time, it was almost um, sacrilegious to think about an irrational number. All numbers were rational, they were whole. But through the Pythagorean theorem, if you think about an isosceles right triangle, right? Think about an isosceles right triangle. Both sides are one. All right, the two legs are one. If the two legs of an isosceles right triangle are one, what is the length of the hypotenuse? Radical two. Radical two was a radical idea. It really was. Okay? People did not like that. They didn't like, like the idea of it. And then how do you show radical two as a fraction? You cannot without rounding. Right? And that's the whole idea of what a rational number is. So before Pythagoras, everything was rational. And he actually proved that radical two is an irrational number and, and his followers. And this was enough to actually cause death and destruction. So the end of the story does not go well for him. Okay? His cult was becoming so big, the Pythagoreans were becoming quite powerful. And of course, there were other um, religious sects that did not like that and did not accept it. So it is told that Pythagoras, his, the land of his life ended with, he was murdered. And his followers were murdered, and his pupils were murdered. So it was not a good ending for them. There's a lot of quotes written down that are believed to be from Pythagoras, or maybe his followers, right? One quote that is not up here right now is three simple words. The three simple words in the quote are, all is number. That was their, their strongest belief, right? Numbers and math were what connected the earth to the heavens. And then he quoted, there is geometry in the humming of the strings, and there is music in the spacing of the spheres. So again, a lot of his work laid the groundwork for Plato, for Aristotle, and then for later for Galileo. And Adam Judd, in a little while, is going to talk to you a little bit more about the music of the spheres. I would like to end this with... Rabbit? That's for all times! Eggheads? Now hold on, Donald. You like music, don't you? What? Well, without eggheads, there would be no music. Uh... Come on. Let's go to ancient Greece, to the time of Pythagoras, the master egghead of them all. Pythagoras? The father of mathematics and music. Mathematics and music? Ah, you'll find mathematics in the darndest places. Watch. First, we'll need a string. Stretch it good and tight, plunk it. Now divide in half, plunk again. You see? It's the same tone, one octave higher. Now divide the next section. And the next. Pythagoras discovered the octave had a ratio of two to one. With simple fractions, he got this. And from this harmony in numbers developed the musical scale of today. That also ties into the golden ratio. It is also said that Pythagoras was one of the first to recognize the idea of the golden ratio, which was then, of course, used by uh, many mathematicians to come after that. Okay. I'm going to give you a few minutes with your partner to answer the questions on the worksheet. If, Amir, if you have any questions. Thanks, guys.